Good morning. If you're coming in, quickly come and find a seat. Let me welcome you this morning to our Stuart Custer Lecture Series. You're going to hear more in the next section, uh, not actually just about this lecture series and who we are honoring. You'll actually hear a clip from Dr. Custer, which I, I think will help and encourage you. We are honored to have with us Dr. Will Varner. Um, had the delightful opportunity last night at a banquet to hear him share his testimony. And uh, though you missed that, um, I, I learned that you will be encouraged by his enthusiasm. What a joyful servant of the Lord. And we are thrilled, Dr. Varner, to have you with us. I was thinking about the topics for these sessions, Messiah, and uh, the passage from Hebrews chapter 11 struck me. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. And that's what we're going to do today. Uh, we'll do that not just in these sessions as he challenges our thinking with regard to who the Lord is, um, but I hope that you'll do that in your heart as you're being challenged from the Word, and I want us to do that this morning as we open. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you today for your goodness to us, goodness that is part of your very nature. You don't just demonstrate goodness. You are good. Thank you that you are righteous and that you are just, that you are kind and you are gracious. Lord, we find all of these truths not in conflict, but in perfect harmony in the sending of your Son to be our Savior, that he could, um, in righteousness, live a sinless life, die a substitutionary death, that he might be just and a justifier of those that believe in him. Lord, we thank you for the opportunity to study your word. Thank you for the gift of your servant, Dr. Varner. We ask that you would bless him as he speaks um, to us during these sessions. Lord, we lift our hearts to you. And we ask, Lord, that you might open them and cleanse them and change them and fill us with your glory. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Singing at this hour, I have a feeling, might be a challenge for some of us. But take heart, since we just had time change, it's really 9 o'clock. And so your voices are already warmed up and you're raring to sing. It's a whole hour later than you think. Since we're uh, talking about Messiah and Genesis, we're going to sing a couple of songs about God and creation. So let's sing two songs. I sing the mighty power of God. Let's stand up, wake up, and sing out. I who holds the oceans in his hand.
Well, thank you so much for your voices in, in honor of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I have the privilege of introducing uh, Dr. Varner. He teaches at Masters University in California. He and his wife, Helen, who's here, if you could stand up so we could, uh, everybody could see you. We're so glad that they're here. They have two adult children um, and one with the Lord, plus four beautiful grandchildren. He grew up in Spartanburg, South Carolina, in an unsaved home and came to the Lord at the age of 17. He attended Bob Jones University, after which he received three master's degrees and a doctorate. While serving as a pastor in Pennsylvania, he experienced his first trip to Israel, which changed the trajectory of his life. And Dr. Stuart Custer was on that trip. Soon after, he was asked to serve with the Friends of Israel Gospel Ministry, which lasted for 17 years of his, um, of, as part of his ministry. And since that first trip to Israel, he has led 51 study trips to the Holy Land. And by the way, Dr. Varner also actually studied under Dr. Custer. So he knows the, the person well in his, in his background for which this uh, lecture series is um, honoring. The Stuart Custer Lecture Series is a series that honors warm, gospel-centered scholarship that exalts the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Dr. Varner has, is a serious scholar, having written 20 books, his favorites being the three books that deal with today's topic on the Messiah. And also, just to know the person, the kind of the, you know, what he does in his spare time, his hobbies include getting involved in Civil War reenactments, Tolkien's fiction, and international spy novels. So he has quite a, quite a background. We're so glad to have you. Let's welcome uh, Dr. Varner now. Thank you, thank you. The last time I was on this platform, I'm sitting there. When was the last? It was my junior year, 1968. Eight. What were you doing, young lady, in 1968? Uh, and uh, I was on the Biblical College Bowl. You say, what's that? It was an idea of Stuart Custer. You know, the College Bowl was a big thing there, and I was representing Basilian. Do they still have Basilian? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay, good, good, yeah. I, and uh, and uh, who was asking the questions? It was not Alex Trebek. Yeah, it was Stuart Custer. <laughs> right here. Don't ask me if we, won, if we won that day, but it was a lot of fun, okay? So it's good to be back on the platform. As the passengers boarded the airliner, they were struck that no uh, flight attendants were greeting them, but everything was going smoothly. And uh, finally, it took off the jet, and over the intercom came a calm uh, voice. Uh, notifying everyone that this was the first fully automated flight in the history of commercial travel. In fact, there were no cabin attendants on board, and there were not even any pilots. This miracle of science, the voice continued, was thoroughly dependable because all mechanisms were fail-safe. To further assist the passengers and listeners, the tape voice of the plane's computer went on to comfort them with the following. There is no need to fear because nothing possibly can go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, go wrong, okay? Now you may question whether that's a true story or not. I'm not going to debate that with you. But what is true is that there were two individuals who thought that they had bet on the right horse in the race. They thought that this uh, Messiah project was coming to fruition. 
Their hopes were high. And everything seemed to go wrong. Go wrong. Go wrong. Cleopas and friend, maybe Mrs. C, I don't know, were on their way back to pick up the broken pieces of their lives because it went wrong. You're familiar with the story. They were joined by a stranger who they didn't recognize right away. And evidently their chins were dragging the ground on the way to Emmaus. And he says, why are you so sad? And they said, you're a stranger in Jerusalem. You don't know what happened. And he says, oh, tell me to draw them out. And they said, well, things couldn't go wrong, but everything went wrong. We thought he was the one. We were there when he entered into Jerusalem. We joined with the crowd and said in Hebrew, Baruch haba Shem Adonai, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Yes, this is the one. And in a few days, we got word that he had been arrested. We got word that he was uh, being uh, before the Sanhedrin. We got word too late to intercede uh, that uh, he was then sent to Pilate. And then we joined that crowd on the place of the skull where we saw the one in whom we were placing all of our hopes dying a miserable, horrible, shameful death. We thought he was the one, but everything went wrong. You know it was Jesus, and he approached them and said, You're foolish to believe not all that the Scripture has spoken. Wasn't it necessary for the Messiah to suffer just like you saw him suffer? It was necessary uh, that he be crucified. It was necessary that... Uh, he died a shameful death. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded unto them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They said, well, we've arrived. You want to join us for dinner? And he did. And it must have been while he was breaking bread that they saw the wounds in his hands. And they said, oh, our Bible teacher was our Messiah that we thought was the wrong horse that we bet on. And he was gone. Immediately they ran to Jerusalem. Now this was probably, you know, I don't know for sure where Emmaus uh, uh, is or was. But we're talking about probably 10 miles out of Jerusalem. Now 10 miles they're running back on that first Sunday evening. And they find the disciples and they say, we saw him. We saw him. Did not our hearts burn within us when he spoke with us by the way? And what? Opened the scriptures. Holy heartburn. That's what we need. And I am praying that uh, this morning we're going to get afflicted with holy heartburn. Did not our hearts burn with us while Jesus gave that Bible study on the way to Emmaus? Uh, and, of course, uh, he appeared in that room, but we'll get to that later, okay? Messiah matters. Now, with Messiah matters, uh, I don't know, uh, that can be a verb or a noun. It can be matters about Messiah, <clears throat> or, or it can be a verb. You know, Messiah really matters, okay? Take it either way you want, but we'll be looking at matters about the Messiah, and I think you'll conclude that Messiah matters uh, as well. And I pray that the holy heartburn uh, that those uh, Cleopas and friend had will be ours uh, today as we examine what the scriptures says about the Messiah. Let's see if this works. Dun -dun 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 -dun. Yo! Oh, good, good. Now, there's three parts to this. First of all, in this lecture, it'll be Messiah in Genesis. And then the next lecture will be Messiah in the Psalms. And the third one will be Messiah in Isaiah. Now that's not all. That's not all. There are many other passages. 
but I've chosen those three. Because it, on that Sunday night, that first resurrection night, when he was with the disciples uh, after that experience, he says, wasn't it necessary for everything written about the Messiah in the law, the prophets, and the Psalms? Now, that was the later part of Luke 24. So that's what I'm doing here. The Torah, particularly about uh, Genesis, and I want us to trace that through then this first session. Then the second session, Messiah in the Psalms. We'll be looking at Psalm 2, Psalm 22, and Psalm 110. And then finally, Messiah and Isaiah. You can probably guess this. Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, and Isaiah 53. Familiar territory, I know. That with many of you, we might say, ho-hum, I know Genesis chapter 3. Or I know uh, Psalm 110. I realize that. So the way I'm going to approach this is, is not really go and explain the background of each of these texts. I'm going to assume that you know the Genesis 3 account of Adam and Eve and the serpent. I'm going to assume that you know this. But what I'm going to do in these lectures, with God's help, is maybe look at some aspects of each of these messianic texts and prophecies that might be a fresh look at them, okay? So I'm going to assume that you know uh, 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 certain things, but I'm going to like, maybe you haven't seen this uh, 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 yet. Or maybe this uh, is a non-traditional way of approaching it. Uh, you know, I, I can't live, I can't teach uh, without being aware of the Jewish interpretation of things. Uh, and uh, so uh, some of the things we bring out might be something that you don't think about every day, but would be very important in talking with the Jewish person. Because these things that we share... As believers in Jesus the Messiah, they say thanks, but no thanks, okay? So I'm going to uh, 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 bring in some things maybe responding to the Jewish anti-Messianic uh, approach to these texts. And I hope that that will be helpful. Uh, and uh, finally, uh, I may even say something that you haven't heard before. I may even say something in the second hour that I, I haven't heard that before, okay? Uh, instead of condemning me, just look at the evidence that I'm going to present, see if it makes sense, and uh, say, okay. Or if you don't want to agree with me, it's okay. You can be wrong if you wish to. All right, good. So be prepared for some fresh looks at this, okay? Genesis chapter 3, you know the story. Adam and Eve, the fall and the serpent. And so I'm going to jump right into the main text uh, be because of time. Genesis 3.15, the proto-evangelium in Latin, the first announcement of the gospel. And interesting, it's not a direct promise to Eve. It's not a direct promise to uh, Adam. <laughs> It's a direct promise to the serpent, okay? Among other things, he says this, I, I will put enmity between you and the woman. There's going to be, you know, I, women don't like snakes, okay? Enmity between you and the woman. And between your seed and her seed, there's going to be a conflict that continues on between uh, uh, followers uh, of the Messiah through their mom, uh, uh, Eve, and your followers. And then I want to get to this. This is what I want to bring out. And, and between your seed and her seed, he shall bruise you on the head. I'm reading from the Bible, you know, and uh, you shall bruise him on the heel. I think the NASB is okay here. All right, good, 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 good. Yeah, yeah all right. Uh, he shall bruise you on the head, and you shall bruise him on the heel. Okay. Nothing can go uh, uh, wrong. Everything went wrong. We thought he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. But he suffered horribly. That's not what we were expecting. But going all the way back, not just to Isaiah 53 that we're going to end this, these sessions with this morning, but going all the way back to Genesis 3.15. There's the idea of the Messiah is going to suffer. 
There are three uh, themes that are brought out in each of these three lectures. The Messiah as Son, the Messiah as Sufferer, and the Messiah as Sovereign. I just saw that last night. I'm throwing it in there. Son, Sufferer, and Sovereign. Uh, those three themes about the Messiah and who He is uh, are brought out in uh, each of these uh, sessions. Now, sufferer. We don't have to go to Psalm 22, though we can. We don't have to go to Isaiah 53. We can go all the way back to the very first promise that says a descendant of the woman will be uh, crushed on the heel. It's a stronger word than bruise. It's a stronger word. Uh, you shall bruise him on the heel, but he shall bruise you on the head. I remember uh, playing ball. I, I always had pain in my heels, okay? Uh, but as bad as it was doing those spurt, growth spurts as a teenager, playing football and, and so forth, uh, it didn't keep me from playing though I knew it was there. Now, you get a bruise on the head, you go into concussion protocol, and rightly so. It's a much more severe bruising, and it's a word that is even stronger than bruise. It's not just a heel bruise or a bruise on the head, as we're going to see, it's a crushing on the head and a crushing on the heel. He is going to be crushed on the heel, on the heel. But in the very process of having his heel crushed, he will crush your head. You won today. You are not going to eventually win. All right. He is going to crush you on the head. It's a very interesting word. It only appears. A few times in the Hebrew Bible. Josephus in the first century says it's more than bruise. Uh, it, it, it means strike a blow. Josephus, a Jewish guy, a Jewish historian, says it means strike a blow. Job says he batters me with a storm. Job was being battered. Uh, same word with this storm of suffering that he was going through. So this is, is a, a crush, batter. Uh, and, and guess what? And in doing that, he's eventually going to batter your head. He's eventually going to strike a blow from which you will never recover. You won today. You will not win the game. Okay? Now, notice... This is very complex. The gender of the pronoun. He. Right? The Hebrew word is who. He, vav, aleph. Who in Hebrew is he. Are you with me? Who is he. All right. It's very clearly, it's a masculine pronoun. However, in the history of interpretation, can you believe that has not always been recognized? Jerome in the Vulgate actually has the Latin ipsa, which means she, instead of the masculine ipse, which means he. In the Vulgate, it says, she shall crush uh, him on the head. Can you believe that? Let me tell you how I learned how that works out. When my mom died, uh, we... Uh, took a lot of the money that we got from her uh, inheritance and took our kids to Europe for the first time. Uh, they got bit with the traveling bug and, and, and uh, they got bit with a lo love for Europe. We went to England, we went to France, we went to Switzerland and finally we came to Italy. We had met a Jewish family on the way, and I had begun to witness to them. And then here we are in Italy, and I think you know what church dominates in Italy. And I said, oh my, how am I going to explain the simplicity of the gospel and who Jesus is with all of this around? I'll never forget this experience. We've gone out to dinner with our Jewish family friends, and we're headed back to the hotel, and we're walking along the sidewalk. Now in Rome... Religious art is all over the place. There are mosaics and paintings 
on the buildings on the sidewalk, okay? And we're walking along, and here's one of those paintings. And it's on a wall. And I said, oh, no. And then I saw it. It's one of those paintings that has got Genesis to, to, to Revelation. It's got everything. It's got the judgment. It's got the crucifixion somewhere in there. And then there she is right in the middle. And she is standing with her he heel on the head of a snake. And, I, and you know what that is. That's the Virgin Mary. Why? Because the Bible says she will crush his head. Oh, it does? And I said, oh, no. How am I going to explain this to this Jewish family? And I'll never forget what that Jewish lady said. She looks at that and she says, it doesn't say that, does it? I said, uh, no, yeah, 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 no, yeah, no, it doesn't. Yeah, you're right. It doesn't say that. The Jewish lady saw through Jerome and all the mistranslation of she shall crush his head. And she says, doesn't it say he? I said, yes, it does. <laughs> and I said, oh, thank you, Lord. Uh, you know, but, uh, you know, uh, can you believe? And, and, and so throughout religious art, uh, here is the gal with the halo around her head, crushing the serpent's head when it actually says he, her descendant, her seed. Not only that, the Septuagint has autos, and those of you who know Greek know that that's the masculine pronoun. He shall crush her on the head. Now there's more, of course, but okay. But this is just the first one. Let's don't limit it and say, oh, yeah, there's a lot more coming. But the ultimate goal is mentioned. As I said for the third time, you won the day. You're not going to eventually win this battle. That's the first promise. Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. Notice it says there. Now, on the screen, you've got to, Varner, what, what you do with the PowerPoint there? Why are you making the, the, uh, the lines shorter and smaller as you go? I wanted to create a visual effect of the narrowing, the narrowing of the promise. This promise is what? The, defend, the, the defeat, the one who defeats uh, Satan, the one who will be the Messiah, what is his genealogy according to the first promise? The human race. Okay? The human race. A male in the human race will defeat Satan. And then in the successive promises in uh, Genesis, and I only mention these in Genesis, it gets narrower and narrower and narrower. The seed of the woman. Now, in Genesis 9... It will be the seed of Shem, the descendant of Shem. Then one of the Shemites, Abram, eventually called Abraham. He will be a descendant of Abram. You see the narrowing? The narrowing? And then, of course, uh, Abraham, Isaac, and, and, and Ishmael, uh, uh, and Jacob. Uh, excuse me, Isaac, uh, Jacob. And Jacob has 12 sons narrowed to Judah. That's where we're going. In this first session. It's a progressive narrowing of the promise. Uh, not, uh, first of all, a, a, a descendant in the human race will win the victory. But narrowing by the time of the, uh, of the book of Genesis, it will be not only a descendant of the human race, but a descendant of Shem, Abram, Isaac, Jacob, and Judah. Okay? Now the second one. In Genesis chapter 9, often overlooked as a messianic text. The ark is parked on Mount Ararat, and uh, Noah and family enters into his brave new world. He's going well, offers a sacrifice, and then things start to be a problem. He plants a vineyard, and as it's the right of the vineyard owner uh, to partake of the vineyard, he partook of the vineyard, and he got drunk. I mentioned to the folks last night that I grew up in the home of an alcoholic, and I saw my father in some very shameful situations uh, when he was so drunk 
he was just out of control and uh, it was embarrassing uh, to us all. So this really lives for me. And so who sees uh, the nakedness of the father? Uh, well, uh, of the three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Ham sees the nakedness of his father. Don't want to get into it. There may be more there. Uh, Leviticus 18 later says, uh, uh, don't uncover the nakedness of a family member. So I don't know if it was just a, a, a glance and he saw him or there was something more and I don't, I don't want to go into it. But we do know this, he went and told it to his brothers. And, and the verb is very strong. It was probably something like this. You know, I saw dad, you know, he was, he was soused. He, he was drunk. And uh, uh, Japheth and Shem, however, instead of adding to the awful shame of their father, take a garment and walk backwards, not even looking at naked Noah, and they cover him. Even in his shame, they honored him. Noah wakes, his mind clears, and God gives him revelation. Let's read it, Genesis chapter 9. He says this, cursed be Canaan. Wait a minute, Canaan? 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 I thought it was Ham that committed the misdeed. Oh, yeah, you saw that. Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, shall he be to his brothers. As he also said, blessed be Yahweh, the God of Shem, and let Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth and let him dwell in the tents of Shem and let Canaan be his servant. Yes, this is a messianic prophecy. Because this promise that Yahweh will be the God of a people will be channeled not immediately through Japheth, not immediately through Ham, but through Shem. Yahweh will be the God of Shem. And thus the narrowing of the promise is now not just to Japheth and to Ham, but through Shem. Do you know that the word Semite comes from Shemite, okay? So the peoples of the Middle East, not just the Jews, the people of the Middle East are the Shemitic people, are Semitic people. Now, I uh, don't want to spend too much time on this, but I do want to mention there is the issue of the non-existent curse on Ham, the non-existent curse on Ham. Notice that uh, the curse is not on Ham, but on Canaan. If you look in chapter 10 and verse 6, you will see the sons of Ham were Cush, Mizraim, Put, and Canaan. Genesis 10, 6. Notice that the curse is not on all of Ham, but is on one branch of the Ham family. The, the uh, son Canaan and his descendants. Do I need to elaborate on the non-existent curse on Ham? Uh, I remember as a kid hearing a southern preacher talking about the curse on Ham and how people who are descendants from Ham are cursed to slavery. Now, of course, I'm sure you know that that is false. It's a non-existent curse on Ham. Now, if you look in Genesis chapter 10, it does look like uh, Ham's descendants, three-fourths of them, did settle in what we call the African continent. But one of them, Canaan, did not settle in the African con uh, con uh, continent uh, like uh, Cush, Mizraim, and Foot. Cush is the Hebrew word for Ethiopia. Mizraim is the Hebrew word for uh, uh, Egypt. Put uh, can be used as the Hebrew word for the area that today we call Libya. So it looks like three of the sons of Ham did settle in Africa. But where did Canaan settle? I'm going to give a quiz. I'm going to give a quiz. Here it is. It's so hard. Where did Canaan and his descendants settle? A, B, C, D is Canaan. Duh. They settled in the land to which their forefather gave their name, Canaan. They did not settle in Africa. 
And they were cursed to slavery. And in, first, in Joshua 9.15, we read that when the Israelites conquered the Canaanites, they put them into bondage, into slavery. Later on, Solomon finished it, 1 Kings 9.15, and put the Canaanites into bondage. That prophecy was fulfilled in the Canaanites becoming slaves to the Shemites and later the Japhetites. The Romans and the Greeks also put the Canaanites into slavery. There was no curse on Ham. Now, what's the blessing on Japheth? Uh, there's a play on words here. Japheth means broad uh, or, or extended. God shall enlarge Japheth. God shall enlarge uh, the one whose name means enlarged. Now, where did he settle? Uh, just about everybody agrees to the north and to the uh, uh, west uh, the area that today would be called uh, Europe, uh, that's probably the Japhetites. Now again, the $64,000 question, where did Canaan settle? In the land of Canaan. How about Shem? Shem were the Middle Eastern peoples, all right? So uh, Abraham, uh, sons uh, Isaac uh, and Ishmael, uh, tr uh, traditionally the Arabs come uh, from Ishmael, the Jewish people come from Isaac, okay? Middle Eastern peoples came from Shem. Notice Yahweh is going to establish a relationship as the God of the Semites. And that's going to be fulfilled as we see in Abraham, uh, Isaac, and Jacob, and uh, Judah. Okay, uh, so uh, what's going on here? God narrows his focus to Shem. Does he care about the Japhetites? He surely does. Does he care about the Hamites? He surely does. But his promise of a Messiah is that he's not going to be a black Messiah from Africa. He's not going to be a Muslim Messiah from the Arabs in the Middle East. He's not going to be uh, uh, from England. Years ago, I heard about the uh, 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 Anglo-American, uh, the, Anglo the British Israelism in prophecy. No, God is not going to send his, uh, his Messiah through the Brits uh, 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 and, and the Irish. Sorry, he's not. He's going to send his Messiah through Shem. Now, if you're Chinese... I have no idea how, where you fit into this. I'm sure God knows. All right. You know, are, are, are you Shemitic? Are you Japhetitic? I don't know. I've wrestled with that for years and stopped wrestling with it. I don't know. But God knows. Because everyone on the face of the earth came from Shem and Ham and Japhet. How about the gospel? Let's jump ahead to the New Testament. Maybe you've not seen this. Maybe this is something new. And so while you consider getting something new, I'm going to have a drink. <clears throat> is the gospel for everybody? Yeah. Think with me in the book of Acts. I once heard a missionary say, every Bible text is a missionary text. I said, oh, every Bible text is a missionary text? And then he preached on Acts 9, and he closed this way. Uh, did, I, did I say Acts 9? Genesis 9. Okay. Uh, he said, in the book of Acts, in Acts 8, Acts 9, and Acts 10, there are three converts. In Acts 8, who is it? The Ethiopian eunuch, a descendant of Ham. You can speak up. You can speak out. Just don't say amen. We'll think you're a wild charismatic if you say amen. Uh, you know. <laughs> the Ethiopian eunuch, a descendant of Ham, comes to faith in the Jewish Messiah. Acts 9. You know who it is. It's Saul. A descendant of Shem comes to faith in the Jewish Messiah. Acts 10. Who is it? Cornelius. I love the King James. He was in the Italian band. I don't know what instrument he played in the Italian band. You know, the Italian cohort. Cornelius, a centurion in the Italian co cohort. You ever seen that? Acts 8, a Hamite. Acts 9, a Shemite. 
Acts 10, a Japheth type. The gospel is for all. He's going to be a Jewish Messiah, yes. He's going to be a descendant of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Judah, and David, yes. But he's going to be for all people. Every text that missionary said so many years ago is a missionary text. And I would say amen to that. All right, the Messiah is the seed of the woman, the seed of Shem. How about the seed of Abram? All right, Genesis 12. Genesis 12. Uh, the Lord said to Abram, the Shemite, go forth from your country, from your relatives, from your father's house to the land which I will show you. And I will make you a great nation. I will bless you, make your name great. You will be a blessing. Now watch this. I will bless those who bless you, curse those who curse you, and in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. God chooses a Shemite. God chooses a, a man, a, a descendant of Shem, and says, in you, all the promises of, of messianic redemption through you is going to take place. And I don't need to tell you who are the descendants of Abraham. But what is often overlooked is that last phrase, in you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. The father of the Jewish people. But through him, all the families of the earth will be blessed. And this did not escape the notice of the Apostle Paul. Who said in Galatians 3 that God loves the nations and wants them to be uh, the recipients of this promise. And he quotes here in you, Abraham. All the nations of the earth will be blessed. I'm a premillennialist. I believe in a future thousand year reign. I believe in the restoration, the spiritual restoration of Israel. I believe in those things because the Bible teaches it. But there's a brand of premillennialism. And sometimes it has manifested itself in dispensationalism. And I'm not here to batter dispensationalism either. But some of my dispensational brethren give the impression wrongly that this was a thing for the Jews. And Jesus came and he presented himself to the Jews. And so the Jews rejected. So because the Jews rejected Christianity 1.0 to the Jews. Christianity 2.0 to the Gentiles. I don't have much patience for that. Because going all the way back to Abraham. This was not, well it didn't work out for the Jews. So we'll, we'll see if it works out for the Gentiles. Oh, it does. Oh, that's good. Really? Yeah, it's good. But from the beginning, it is said that the Gentiles will come to faith. And that's confirmed to his son, uh, 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 Isaac. It's confirmed to Jacob. And it's going to be picked up in the promise to Judah that we're going to finish with today. Until him shall the gathering of the nations be. From the beginning... And this Gentile boy from South Carolina, from Spartanburg, who never met a Jewish person in his life until he went up north. I'm so thankful that uh, through this Jewish Messiah, I can have hope and faith in that Jewish Messiah. And it was planned from the beginning with Abraham. Oh, oh I forgot something. Thank you for reminding me. Uh, Bob, back in Acts 9, back in Genesis 9, sorry, I forgot this, um, God shall enlarge Japheth, and he will come to dwell in the tents of Shem. Ah, there we go. It goes all the way back before Abraham, because Japheth, the father of the European Gentile, some days he'll come to dwell in the tents of Shem. Now, who is in the tents of Shem? God. And the, uh, the, uh, the uh, 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 Japhetites are going to come to dwell in the tents of Shem. That's an agricultural metaphor. It's a farming metaphor. It's a, it, it's a Bedouin metaphor. 
To dwell in somebody's tents means you share what they share. I broke off in one of my tour groups one day because we got back early. It was in Tiberias, and I went wandering on my own. My wife gets nervous when she hears that. And I found a Bedouin encampment in the Galilee. They're hardly ever there. And then as I approached the Bedouin encampment, Muhammad came out to meet me. Later on, I put all this together. You don't just walk into an area of a Bedouin tent. Somebody sees you, they come out to meet you. Think of Genesis chapter 18. The three visitors come and Abram goes out to meet them. What does Abraham do? He says, well, nice to meet you, see you later. No, come on into my tent. That's what he said. Come on into my tent. I said, oh boy, here I am. And so I'm sitting squatting around a fire with Muhammad in his tent and waiting for the next thing. He said, coffee. I said, oh, I love coffee. I love coffee. Yeah. And he got it over the fire and he started pouring it. It took him about 10 seconds to pour a little cup. Do you get the idea? And I, and I said, shukran, Habibi, shukran. He said, afwan, afwan, no teeth. You know, and he's smiling. And I drunk it. <laughs> shukran. <laughs> it was burning all the way down, and I'm smiling. He says, more. <laughs> and now he says, the food, the food. I said, no, 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 not the food, not the food, not the food. Uh, you know, enough for the coffee, enough for the coffee. And I, find, I had to pull myself away from the tent. I was dwelling in his tent. He was sharing what was his with me. The Japhetites are going to come to dwell in the tents of Shem. They're going to partake of what is the right of the Shemites. You know, the gospel. I left and I walked back to the hotel. As I'm walking back to the hotel, the road in front of me started curving. Started curving like this. Started curving. And I got back to the hotel. Everybody's running around me. I was in a Bedouin tent. Israeli guide came over and said, you were in a Bedouin tent? He said, you drank the coffee? I said, yes. He says, Bedouin put hashish in their coffee. I said, no, no, I know why the road was going back and forth. Back and forth. <laughs> Don't judge me. Sin of ignorance. Okay, good, good, good. All right. But I was dwelling in his tent. He wanted to give me a meal. Who knows? He may have even promised me his daughter by the end of the day. I was dwelling in his tents. That's Bedouin hospitality. Japheth is going to come to dwell in the tents of Shem. I'm thankful for that. And so, Abraham, in you shall all the families of the earth be blessed. Let's go to the fourth one. Got time. The seed of Judah, the seed of Judah. Three themes here that are, are, are brought out in each of these three lectures. The seed, uh, the son, the sufferer, and the sovereign. The sufferer was brought out in Genesis 3.15. The son, or seed, is brought out in the promise to Abraham. Now, the sovereign Genesis chapter 49. All right. In Genesis chapter 49, we have Jacob's dozen. I wrote a book called the, uh, 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 Jacob's Dozen, The Tribes of Israel in History and Prophecy. It was my second book. I was riding on a bus in Israel with students. I said, um, I'm, I've written this book on the 12 tribes of Israel, the 12 sons of Jacob, and I've got to come up with a title. And so one of the students says, how about the Dirty Dozen? <laughs> and the more I thought about it, and the more I said, yeah, that could probably be <laughs> applicable to some of the sons. But I, I didn't want to be that radical. The, would you buy that book, The Dirty Dozen? Anyway, anyway, so I called it Jacob's Dozen. Jacob's about to die. And uh, he gathers uh, his sons around his deathbed. And I think they've propped up the old man there in the, uh, in the bed. And he's got them. Reuben, Simeon, Levi, Judah, uh, Dan, Naphtali, Gad, Asher, Zebulun. Then Joseph. 
and Benjamin. And he's got them around. Can you imagine the drama, the, the intensity of the drama being brought out? You used to watch movies where at the beginning of the movie, the lawyer would have all of the surviving children around his desk. And he's reading the last will and testament of the papa who had passed on him. I remember that scene so often. And as he reads off, to Joe, I leave this. To uh, Janice, I leave this. And to Bob, I leave nothing. And he gets up and he storms out. <laughs> Drama. What is he going to leave me? And so as they're around uh, Jacob, what are they going to say about me? Did he remember what I did? Is he going to hold it against me? Reuben, you're unstable. Simeon and Levi, you got too, your anger got too much of you. Uh, so Reuben was the firstborn, okay? But he passes over Reuben. Reuben is, uh, is the one, as you probably uh, well remember. Uh, 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 uncontrolled is water. You shall not have preeminence. You went up to your father's bed. Reuben had messed around with one of his father's uh, concubines. Passover Reuben. Simeon and Levi. Simeon and Levi were the ones who, because of the honor of their sister being uh, raped uh, uh, by, the men of, uh, by one man in Shechem, they said, we're going to regain the honor of, of Dinah. And they go in, and they not only kill the guy who had raped her, they kill all the men in the town. That's where the punishment did not fit the crime. And Jacob said earlier, you're going to cause us to stench to stink in all the nostrils of the Canaanites by this vigilante over-justice. And so what? Uh, Simeon and Levi, you'll be scattered in Israel. Simeon received no separate uh, 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 land grant. He was within Judah. Levi actually was spread over all of the 12 tribes. Now finally, Judah. He turns to Judah, and Judah is considered as his heir, okay, his primary heir. It's interesting that Judah becomes the leading tribe. Judah had already shown in, in Egypt that he was the leader of his brothers by offering himself for Benjamin uh, in the Joseph story. So Judah had risen to prominence, and Judah is going to be the leading tribe. And he's also going to be the tribe through whom the Messiah Verse 8, Judah, your brothers shall praise you. Play on words there. Yehuda means praise the Lord. So your brothers will praise you. Your hand will be on the neck of your enemies. Judah will produce great soldiers, and they did. Judah is a lion's cub. Now watch the reference to lions here. Lion's whelp. From the prey, my son, you've gone up. He couches. He lies down as a lion. And as a lion... Who dares uh, rouse him up? Each of the tribes of Israel in Jewish tradition have a uh, symbol. And I don't need to tell you what's the symbol for the tribe of Judah. A lion. Lion of Judah. Okay? Now, having said that, that lion, the king of the beasts, okay? Oftentimes, and even in ancient times, that was viewed that way. Notice the kingly role of Judah. Verse 10. The scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a ruler's staff from between his feet, until Shiloh comes. And to him shall be the obedience of the peoples. All right. So here we are uh, with Judah. And he's called a lion. And we have this promise. And he's, he, he's, called, he's the, the scepter. Now, scepter is the symbol of royalty. Most recently, we Americans have viewed uh, me and my wife, who are great Anglophiles, with great interest, the death of the monarch of Britain and the coronation of her successor. I'm going to date myself right here. The earliest thing I ever remember watching on TV, Bob, was the coronation of Queen Elizabeth II on that black and white TV, <laughs> seeing her there with the scepter, the scepter. So even in other areas of kings and royalty, the scepter is the symbol of the kingly rule. 
the scepter, and uh, nor uh, the ruler's staff from between his feet. Now, I realize that some would say this is the lawgiver, but I think the best translation here is the ruler's staff in the poetic parallelism in the Hebrew poetry, uh, scepter and, um, and ruler's staff, two symbols, are a lot better than the mixing up of the parallelism by saying the scepter and the lawgiver. Uh, so the scepter shall not depart from Judah, a ruler's staff. You can see the king standing there, scepter in one hand, ruler's staff between his feet. This is royalty. When you look for a king in the future generations, the rightful kings will come from Judah. Going all the way back to this promise. Now, <clears throat> a couple of things here. A couple of things. Shiloh. I, I'm fully aware, for those of you who know your Hebrew and know your versions, I'm fully aware that there's the possibility that this could be to him to whom it belongs. Okay? And some translations have that. We stuck with Shiloh. I participated in the translation of the Legacy Standard Bible. And we kept Shiloh here, not because just the New American Standard has it, but we felt like that's the name that should be here. Shiloh is the subject of the verb, okay? Uh, the scepter shall not, until Shiloh comes, unto him shall the be the obedience of the people. Until Shiloh comes. Shiloh is etymologically related to the Hebrew word shalom, which means peace. And how appropriate that Shiloh, later on, another title for this messianic uh, king would be what? Prince of Peace. We're going to see that in our third session uh, as we look at Isaiah chapter 9. So Shiloh. Now I realize that some say, well, to him to whom it belongs. But you've got to change the Hebrew text slightly to get that. As it reads, Sheen, Lamed, Hay, it means it. It is pronounced Shiloh. So uh, if, if you don't change the Hebrew text the way it is, it's a personal name, Shiloh. Do Jews uh, view this as um, messianic? Not today, but in history they did. I was witnessing to a Jewish man <clears throat> right in the heart of Jerusalem, uh, in the square there, right in the heart of Jerusalem. And he says, you cannot produce any uh, Jewish source uh, that uh, says that that's the Messiah. I said, how about Rashi? He says, Rashi? I said, yeah. Rashi is like, when you say Rashi, everybody sits up and takes notice, okay? When you say Rashi in regard to the Talmud, everybody sits up and takes notice. When you say Rashi, <laughs> uh, uh, the great Bible commentary uh, tater from the uh, 12th and 13th century. Rashi is like, okay, we'll listen to Rashi. Rashi said one of the names of the Messiah is Shiloh. The Targum Ankelos and, Jewish, uh, and Jerusalem Targum from the 1st and 2nd centuries, translations of the Hebrew into Aramaic, translate this as Shiloh. Sanhedrin 98b says Messiah's name is Shiloh. I am quoting ancient Jewish texts. Uh, and even Rashi says it's Shiloh. So I'm going to go with that, okay? Now, Shiloh, etymologically related to the word shalom, peacemaker, prince of peace, it makes sense. Now, here's the deal. <clears throat> the right to rule is always going to be with the tribe of Judah. You say, well, <clears throat> how about Saul? Ah, that's the exception that proves the rule. <clears throat> we want a king. We want a king. We want this guy. He's, he's head and shoulders above everybody else. We want a king to be like the nations. And this is the one we want. Samuel says, okay, you got him. Saul, you're the king. I'm going to say it right here. He kissed him. All right? Remember that. He kissed him and poured oil on him. And the people got their king. And they got what they deserved. And Saul blows it. And he's replaced, I think you know this, by David. The same one. 
who anointed Saul later anoints David. David is from what tribe? Judah. Now, you see, it's narrowing even further. But if I kept narrowing it, it was going to get so small you couldn't read it. You think, I can read it back there on that screen? <laughs> no. So, so um, it, it, it's narrowing. Mankind, the deliverer will come from mankind. The deliverer will come from Abraham. The deliverer will come from Judah. Eventually, we don't have time to go into it in these sessions. The deliverer will come from David. This is so, so important. So, so important. Because if the Messiah hasn't come yet, friends... How are we going to know him when he comes? He's going to have to be from the tribe of Judah and the family of David. Problem. Jewish people don't know what tribe they're from today, except the tribe of Levi and the Kohanim within the tribe of Levi. They have kept up, not because they have any documents that show that, but a father who's a Levite or a Kohen tells his son, son, you're a Levite, son, you're a Kohen. It's passes it on. And it's important to do that because when they have the reading of the Torah in the synagogue, the uh, Kohanim, the priests, are invited first to, uh, to, uh, to, to read the scripture in the synagogue. So you have to know if you're a priest. At the end of the synagogue service, a, a Kohen comes up and he does this, puts his hands like this, and he says in Hebrew, I'll say it in English, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Number 6, 24 through 26. And they always hold their hands like that. If you go into a Jewish cemetery, you'll see on, uh, on the uh, tombs uh, stone of a Kohen, hands like that. You know, he's a, he, and now, now from the sublime to the silly. Are you old enough to remember? You old enough to remember? All right. What was his name? Spock. Spock was Jewish. All actors are Jewish. You know, Spock was Jewish. Everybody was Jewish. All actors are Jewish. Even, I'm, I'm exaggerating, of course. All actors are Jewish. Spock gave an interview and said, the way I came up with the Vulcan sign was I remember as a kid seeing these old Jewish men at the front, babbling in a language I didn't understand and holding their hands like that. And I said, that's cool. So that's the sign of the Vulcan. Aren't you glad you came today? <laughs> Aren't you glad you came today? All right, good. You know. so, so Jews know uh, what tribe they're from because they've got to pronounce the benediction. But the rest of the tribes... Jews don't know what tribe they're from. All the records were destroyed. Only the oral tradition of Levi and Kohen are passed down. Jews don't know what tribe they're from. As a matter of fact, they, dis they divide up Israel into the Leviim, the Kohanim, and all Israel. That's how they say it. Because you don't know what tribe you're from. Problem. If the Messiah hasn't come, and he's got to be from the tribe of Judah, how are you going to know he's making a correct claim when he says, I'm the Messiah, if you don't know what tribe he's from? He can't be from the tribe of Levi. He's got to be from the tribe of Judah. You see the problem? It's a big problem. In 70 AD, when, when Titus destroyed Jerusalem, all oh, the records all the city hall records, if you want to call them that, were destroyed. All the genealogical records. You can read them in Ezra 9 and Nehemiah 9. They were there. They knew what tribe they were from until the first century. And it all went up in flames in 70 AD. And nobody knows, except for the oral tradition of the tribe of Levi, what tribe they're from. Do you see my point? We don't get, have to get into it right now. But Daniel 9 says, one of the clear references to Mashiach, Mashiach will be cut off. He will die a violent death. And then the people of the prince shall come, shall destroy the city and the sanctuary. Whatever you believe about the 70 weeks and the 69 weeks, 
It's hard with a, you have to have a calculator <laughs> to witness to a Jewish person, to count up, I, I know. But that passage can be very simply explained by the following. Messiah will be cut off and then will come the destruction of Jerusalem. Everybody knows when the destruction of Jerusalem came in place. So here we have Daniel 9, Messiah will be cut off before the destruction of Jerusalem. That's important. And here we read, he's from the tribe of Judah, so people will have to know what tribe they're from so they can recognize Mashiach, the Messiah. And I'm the Messiah. What tribe you're from? I, I, I don't know. I, I, I. You see the problem. I had the privilege of getting a, Jewish, uh, a, a master's degree in Jewish studies at Dropsy uh, University in Philadelphia. It has re uh, more recently merged with the University of Pennsylvania um, School of Ancient Near Eastern Studies. I had all Jewish um, uh, professors. <laughs> and one year I was going to take medieval Judaism, history of medieval Judaism. Sound exciting? <laughs> Dr. M uh, Vera Maureen, graduate of Princeton, got her doctorate from Yale, Orthodox Jew, she's teaching me medieval Judaism. <clears throat> now, okay, the unique thing was I was the only student in the class for two semesters, 15 weeks, mano a mano. Dr. Maureen and I studying medieval Judaism together. She said at the beginning, I don't want to lecture to you every week. You do the reading, and I will ask you questions. Oral exam every week. That's when I went bald. <laughs> Oral exam every week. So finally we got to the Messiah in medieval Judaism. And Dr. Maureen says, well, I guess... She knew I was a Christian. Uh, she said, um, well, I guess you've been waiting for this <laughs> week, haven't you, the Messiah? I said, yes, I have. And then she said this. I wasn't Dr. Varner then. Mr. Varner, I want to tell you something. To me, Christianity is totally irrational and highly mystical, and I don't see how any thinking person can believe it. I looked around at my classmates, and nobody uh, responded, so I said, okay. I said, can I have a few minutes? She said, you have the floor. I said, oh, Lord. 25 minutes, I had the floor. And for some reason, I ended this way. Having given all the evidence of the Messianic prophecy, I said this. He must be from the tribe of Judah and the family of David. She agreed with that. I said, but all those records were destroyed in 70. No one knows they're from the tribe of Judah and the family of David today. Dr. Maureen, how will you know him when he comes? This is what she said. PhD from, did I say Yale? Yale, PhD from Yale. She said, somebody somewhere must have kept the records. Because I want to know him when he comes. I said, Dr. Marie, you know that no one has kept those records. But you can know him. Because he came when he could show he was from the tribe of Judah. And the family of David. I wish I could tell you that she fell down at my feet and said, what must I do to be saved? Boy, that would be a great way to end this. But that would be a lie. No, she didn't say that. But she did never again say that Christianity is totally irrational and I don't say how any thinking person can believe it. Lion of the tribe of Judah. I must close. There's a throne sitter with a scroll in his hand. And I wept much because I I didn't know what was written in the scroll. How is it all going to end? And then a cry came forth. Behold, the lion of the tribe of Judah has prevailed to open the scroll. And that lion came and opened the scroll. There's something else about that. But that has to wait until a later lecture. Father, thank you that the Messiah is revealed in the book of Genesis. Thank you that Jesus fits all the qualifications, a descendant of all those people, and the lion of the tribe of Judah. May we love him more dearly and follow him more nearly. In his name we pray. Amen.
Thank you so much, Dr. Varner. Much more to come. Uh, just a few announcements. If you're an undergraduate student here, um, please make sure that you have your ID scanned. Uh, if you're in a Bible class and you're hoping to not uh, have a, a, an attendance problem, please um, have your ID scanned after this session. Um, if you didn't get one of Dr. Varner's books in the, in the lobby, we had 150 of those for, for our guests. Please uh, stop by the lobby and, and get one of those. Uh, during the break, uh, we have some slides that will be cycling uh, on the screen. And some of those things might be helpful to you. Some having to do with our new church staffing service. Uh, the Church Matching Scholarship, and then Core Conference in uh, 2023, at the beginning of 2023. We'll take um, 15 minutes, and we'll start promptly at 9.30.